Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I've heard from hundreds of constituents in my congressional district. There are approximately five and a half million in Pennsylvania. I've reviewed each and every one of the constituent stories that I've received, and uh, amongst my growing concerns, uh, your baseline security practices leading up to the breach, the company's awareness of the breach developments and relevant timing, how consumers can get assistance in securing their accounts, how reliable the recovery efforts are in the wake of the breach, and the path forward long-term for consumers' personal information and making sure they are safe despite the breach. And it's this last one that is so particularly angering because it is going to potentially be so destructive to hundreds of millions of Americans what might happen to them in the years to come. And as the head of the company and throughout the company, the culture of that company has to know how predictable the damage can potentially be. And so I ask you, is it not predictable how bad it might get for the individuals who have been compromised in terms of how much damage could be wrought upon them individually in the years to come? Congressman, let me start by saying that, uh, uh, like you, I've talked to constituents, consumers uh, across this country who have been impacted. I've personally read letters from, from consumers complaining uh, voicing their anger and frustration. So I know what you are seeing back home in Pennsylvania. But see, I think the, the anger is going to be multiplied thousands of times when something actually happens. And so when you talk about how predictable some of this is, the rollout of the call centers and the, and the second rollout and the third rollout, it has to be predictable how massive this is and what would need to be put in place from a protocol perspective in order to address what's coming and the slow rollout and how poor it was done, to me, is just inexcusable. I mean, you have to have departments dedicated to dealing with this potential, and it doesn't appear to me as though that was planned. Or if it was planned, it was planned extremely poorly. I understand your point, but it requires a little more color. We went from 500 call center agents to a need of almost 3,000 properly handled call center agents to handle consumer calls took time. We did the best we could in a short period of time. We ramped those up. I mentioned in my opening comments, two of our larger call centers in the first weekend. Understand the hurricane. Taken out by Hurricane Irma. We were not prepared for that kind of call volume. How couldn't you be? How couldn't you be? It's not our traditional business model. We, our traditional business model is dealing with cut companies, not 400 million consumers but, coming to but our website. But, but your business model has a couple hundred million customers. So on a breach of this scale, obviously you're going to have th at least that number and probably twice that amount of people calling, inquiring as to whether or not they're subject to the breach. And that wasn't done. Congressman, the difference is, again, the primary business model we have is dealing with companies, not with hundreds of millions of consumers. We did the best we could to react as quickly as we could. I'd mentioned that the service is getting better uh, each and every day. We've listened to consumers' feedback, tried to make changes to the website, you're, to make changes to the call center. You're familiar with the safeguards rule. That's essentially what you operate under. Yes. Um, how often does a forensic consultant issue a letter or a certification or a law firm issue a certification that they feel your protocol is in compliance with the safeguards rule? We are in compliance. I'm not sure how often that is actually communicated. Is you're saying communicated? How would you know that you're in compliance then? Because if you said you followed protocol and protocol led to this, then it's very difficult for me. I mean, that, that calls into question what <laughs> whether the safeguards rule is sufficient enough, because if you're saying that you're in compliance with it and you follow protocol and this still happened, that, that unearths a whole other set of questions. Again, the speed of reaction and the scale of the reaction was unprecedented. For, I'm not taking excuses. Yeah. But there's a corporate governance issue here, as I see it, and that is your board of directors gets together, your CEO, you have a chief information officer, you have a chief security officer, and at least once a year, and probably quarterly, you're, you have, I presume, outside forensic consultants doing this stuff every single day from you on retainer. And the speed at which you have to do this just to run your company operationally 
you don't ever stop. It, it's, it's obviously ongoing and persistent. And it just seems to me that through insurance policies, through reporting to your board, through your board wanting to make sure that they're doing their job, that you're gonna be looking for certifications from your outside forensic consultants doing audits to say, yep, you're doing good, you're doing good. Here are the new threats, here's how we're updating. And I just don't see, that's the kind of information I think would be extremely helpful that we have not received any information from today. But I would ask you, since I'm well over my time, that I'd like to know how often your board asks you to certify whether or not you're in compliance, and what is that protocol, and how, when was the last time you updated that protocol? You said you've complied with protocol. When was the last time that that was updated? I understand your question. We'll get to that information. Do you yield back after you're already well over? Uh, <laughs> I yield back. Time has expired. How's that?